Heeft u uh, enough oxygen to step into the next uh, uh, small um, lecture that, uh, that we will have? I'm really uh, happy um, to be invited here by um, Peggy and Lieve, whose uh, work in uh, Belgium I really uh, recognize and admire. We're trying in the Netherlands to do the same, and that's maybe also why the title of the book that we made has such a, like, a, you know, we should do something. Operatie, wooncoöperatie. It doesn't come easy. We tried in Rotterdam with the Rotterdam Woongenootschap. We tried for four, almost four years, and we three times we almost touched the finish line. Uh, but in the end, basically, where we stranded was the point that was uh, made very clear by uh, Thomas, the land <coughs> policy and the way uh, land is priced. And I think it's very fundamental that this, um, this is addressed um, here tonight as well. Um, but I'm asked by Peggy as well to speak about architecture and to the architectural quality that um, the cooperatives um, are, are um, providing. Um, the book that we made is published in uh, last January and since then um, it really packed up and I think that also has to do with this. Um, in the book, when we were writing it, I had a picture from the 1980s uh, when our previous queen Beatrix was crowned and then there were riots in Amsterdam, um, riots for affordable housing, for uh, the anti-speculation of housing in the, in the cities. Um, and uh, that was the last time we had riots or people marching in the streets for housing, for affordability of housing. Uh, that was uh, when we were writing the book. And then last year, suddenly, this social unrest emerged. And there were in all the cities in the Netherlands, all the major cities, we had these housing protests. People marching in the streets and claiming the right of housing not just to be a, um, a commodity, not an exchange value, but really a use value. And here you see on the sign, wonen is geen mark, Rutte, markt, wonen is een recht, our prime minister. And I think it's mainly what you see here is that in this, this whole neoliberal agenda, which sees the housing market primarily as a huge opportunity to make money, and also the way the whole building column is organized in a way which is facilitating this and says, well, we have no alternative. We should, if we want to build, we have these investors and with these investors we are able to build. And this is really something that we should, um, we should provide the alternative and that's where the cooperative also comes in uh, as one of the, yeah, we say also the der de Baustrom, a third model in the housing market. And I think if you look at what happens there with the cooperative and also what's quite different from everything that we know, it's no longer about the question, how do I want to live? You know, I know how I want to live, but it's much more interesting to have a discussion with each other about how do we want to live together in our towns and cities tomorrow, which stretches it to a social agenda, which stretches it to a, an agenda which is about the context where we live in. And it's also stretching to not just my ideas of good living at this moment, but also thinking for maybe myself over 10 years or you over 10 years in my situation now or maybe the next generations. If we build, we build for let's say 50 or 100 years. So we should think about that. And I think the cooperatives is, are really providing a, um, a social way to do that together. And I've, I hope to illustrate in my small lecture tonight um, how this becomes visible in the projects that we have visited and documented in our book. But I want to start in Amsterdam. This is 1895, so the previous century before the previous century. And this is, the, this is a, a nice group portrait in which you can see the whole of the society, those who can bear hats and those who have caps, um, those who, um, those who have, uh, are, are working here and those who are working at the office and uh, providing the financial uh, support for this. This is one of the, this is the, the, the foundation stone of the um, eerste uh, maatschappij ter verkrijging van de eigen woning. So this is a cooperative in 1895. In the Dutch system, um, we have a <coughs> big tradition in social housing, but we lost the chance of a tradition in cooperative housing quite shortly after this moment, when our Housing um, Act of 1901 started, where uh, the, the cooperative model was not favored because 
the idea was that people would have the, the individual people would have the opportunity to um, that the, the assets that are built up in the cooperatives would turn into their private assets. It's a risk if you don't organize it well enough. And this risk was, uh, was enough to say that we, we would like to do it different. But at the same time, this is a picture, another nice group picture. Um, 25th of June 2016, you can see on the building from the Allgemeine Baugenossenschaft in Zurich. So this is their annual uh, meeting of every member of the cooperative um, uh, who can vote, one person, one vote. They're voting about the budget, they're voting about the, the, the way uh, investments should be done, um, the maintenance should be done. All these things which come back annually on the agenda are voted for and this is a very festive meeting because the Allgemeine Baugenossenschaft was um, started in 1916, so this is their 100th anniversary um, meeting. I think this is really something uh, we should have in the back of our heads if we look at housing projects. We have the stones, you have this community of people behind it, but it's not just a community and it's not just stones, it's also an enterprise, as Peggy also said, but it also has its own rules and regulations and transactions which are part of the introduction that Thomas gave us. Um, and I think it's very interesting to um, also to understand this. We have some similarities tonight. This is our godmother um, uh, from the ideas of the Commons. She studied at Eleanor Ostrom. And I think she, what she made very clear is that the, the, the decisive element of what cost or curiosity is that cooperatives or commons have this resilience over a long time, so they're able to adapt to quite different situations, and they're able to provide the basic needs of this long time, and they're able to um, turn stewardship into a, a real productive term, so they're providing for the group um, what they need. She studied it for all different kind of commons, so fishery grounds, the uh, harvesting of, uh, of uh, trees, etc. So these kind of commons. Um, but the housing market is quite different from that, and I think it's interesting to apply her thinking to the housing market, but it's also difficult. Basically, I think it's most important that we understand that it's not just the domain where we have the government on the one hand and the market on the other hand as the two options that we have, and you as a citizen or as a consumer, but that we collectively as citizens are able to organize and to do things that are in public favor, but also do them in a, in a way that is uh, uh, entrepreneurial, but not commercial. And basically, that's the whole idea behind the book, and that's also why I think it's so important to promote the idea of cooperative housing as a third model, because it's, it's neither a social provision from the public sector, it's also not a commercial model, it's not a mixture of, of them, it's a, it's a whole different um, domain, uh, the commons or the gemeenschapseconomy. Well, this commons also, if you translate it to the process of building, and uh, in the process of building and maintaining uh, real estate, it also has its own, um, its own logic, and I hope to make visible how this, how this works. Um, it has its own logic when it comes to commissioning uh, uh, architecture or commissioning these projects. You see here I used the, the models of the um, Genossenschaft Kogro, um, Kooperative um, Großstadt from Munich. They have very clear models and I like this one. It says, how much participation do you have in the different stages of the process? It starts with defining a vision to together and in finding a, a piece of land and defining how you want to live together, this first question which I posed. Then it moves to um, what Christian also um, uh, uh, was showing. If you have your vision and translate it to design and make this design also part of public um, uh, debate and, and, and um, exchange, um, you can step to the next phase of the uh, realization and then there's this phase of using it and also using it in a way that adapts uh, with the change over time of the need and demands that you can see. So th that's one thing, so this, 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 this specific way of commissioning and using the architecture and uh, housing. The th second thing which is 
um, uh, typical is the financing. So it's a shared ownership. So instead of all models, the, um, the ownership and the financing is done by the, the Genossenschaft. You have one big mortgage. You, um, as individuals, you contribute to the, um, the um, that eigen vermogen, I don't know how to translate that, <laughs> of your cooperative, which also means that you're collective owning it, collectively own it, owning it. If you don't have this, um, um, this own shares in it, it's a totally different uh, situation. Um, and the th then there's also this, this, it has a different way of management and of decision making, who decides. You saw these people were holding up their hands, but the decisions to be made have to be prepared. And also on a daily basis there, there are decisions that need to be made. Um, and this is, this is very clear that in this model that at the top of the, you know, the, the way decisions are made, the, the algemene vergadering, the mitgliederversammlung, or the, you know, the, 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 the common meeting, is the is the top, and it gives the it gives the framework in which all the other um, 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 elements of the organization are functioning. And then this is really the yeah the game changer. If you if you're looking for it, you find it here. Basically, it says this model says we don't need to raise more money than we need to continue the operation of this building. And basically it means that in the, on the long run, you can see that it, it builds up, you, you, um, the mortgage is paid off, so in the long run, the amount of mortgage uh, can be diminished. You're building up your reservations for uh, uh, maintenance and for unforeseen uh, moments. You're paying for the organization a fee, and you're building up gradually, that's the top, you're building up gradually capital, which can be used to reinvest. So we have the model, which you see in Zurich, that once there is a sound system of cooperatives, it's very easy to start new cooperatives because the capital is available, the own capital of these Genossenschaft. And I think this, well, I said, this is the game changer. Also for you as an individual, because in every other model, this line doesn't go like this. This is this also, I must admit, this is a little bit um, hypothetical because you have to increase your rents to uh, to follow also the um, uh, inflation to follow that you know but basically it doesn't have to um, to um, to go up very steep uh, meaning that also what you build now will be relatively more available over 10 year and rel relatively very available over 20 years of time so this is really also something we should consider and then this was the this was you you could say the, the the field of forces in which we also found ourselves when we were in Rotterdam organizing our project. You have your idea, your vision on one hand, on which you as the as the commons as the uh, cooperative you um, you decide together. You have to negotiate negotiate with your architects and with the contractors that you uh, do. You have to provide in financing, and you can decide together what's the amount of rents that we. Um, that we can afford. And this system, uh, organizing this system in balance together is what the act is that the cooperative as a commons is doing. So it's about the, the community, it's about the stones, the shared ownership of that, and it's about who gets there, how is it financed, uh, what are the um, negotiations that we have about that. So then this translates and ex is expressed in architecture and I think um, I think it's interesting to see in the book we studied three cities. Zurich, of course, because it's very prominent there and it's very visible and the quality is also very high there. But we, all, we thought we should also see how in other contexts, under different conditions, also these kind of projects can be found. So we also studied uh, Vienna and we also studied Munich. Munich. Um, so I'll use some of the projects that are documented in the book as well to show you in like five points how the cooperatives are providing a kind of architecture on which Christian also was hinting very much, which is, which is different, not only in its expression, but also in its use and in its function. I start with the basics, as I say here, redistributed, and the basics of architecture and housing are well, light and air, basically. 
So this project, Hollunderhof in, uh, in Zurich, show how this is done very beautifully in these, in these courtyards, which are oriented to a park, and on the other side there's a quite busy road. And every house has this, has this splendid view over the park. Um, and uh, this is a cooperative, which is also interesting, which does not have very much um, collective space. It, the, the way to get to your own apartment is very narrow and not very um, inviting. Also because the nature of this cooperative is quite conservative, as we learned. But basically, you see that they are able to provide these kind of apartments, which have a, a beautiful uh, orientation on the light, which have a beautiful space to sit outside in summer and in winter. Uh, they're functioning very well. <coughs> but there's also a very specific thing to cooperatives. That it's not that if you decide together this is the design for our project, you don't know where you will live. It's not that the group is already defined and that you, you choose to op optimize your apartment here and someone else optimizes their apartment there. It's, it's not foreseen. So one, mechanic, uh, one, one, one way of working with the cooperative is that every apartment should have uh, the same quality because you could end up in every apartment or they even have rules that if, you're, if your household is changing, if it's growing or it's diminishing, you move to an apartment that fits the size of your household. So every apartment should be should have the same quality, and I think this is a beautiful illustration of that. You see that one, um, the balcony uh, uh, has uh, a large balcony which is orientated very well on the sun. Uh, on the other um, side, you see the balcony which is oriented on two sides of the building, which is also an enormous quality. I don't know if these kind of apartments are built in the Netherlands. For sure, they are not. Another project here, Bucher, also in Zurich, is an is a way to, to see how small apartments are also um, something which can have a very um, a grand quality, you could say. Um, so diminishing the space per, uh, per uh, inhabitant is something which is also, from the uh, viewpoint of sustainability, something that's very important. It's very much on the agenda of Swiss cooperatives as well. But how to do that? And I think this model really shows how you can have a relatively small apartments which feels really elegant and great. Uh, done by a very simple um, uh, uh, arrangement in which you have this double height. Also here on the side of the, of the very tra uh, intense traffic um, um, uh, side of the building. Um, and on the other side you have the public courtyard, which is green, and where the balconies are leading to this kind of project. Where also the way you entrance your apartment, um, the way your um, uh, the everyday needs that every household has, in the winter with wet shoes and in the summer with your sandy back from the shore, um, that you can arrange those things as well. Second thing I want to talk about is the luxury of sharing. So they the basic idea is that everything that you don't need in your own apartment on a daily basis, you could share together. Um, in the Dutch culture of housing, this is not very easy. But we found out when we organized in, the, uh, in Rotterdam and had our conversations with people that they really are willing to make this step and really understand that this gives a quality to your individual house as well. And that is also gives a quality to the, well, the, the things that you have together. So you see here one of the washing machine rooms that has uh, almost every cooperative in Zurich has them. And also we've seen them in Vienna and in Munich a lot. But also the um, collective storage facilities um, with all the rules that come with that. <laughs> um, the... Um, um, we call it a thing, a library of things. So things that you don't need, like skis, or um, uh, uh, if you are uh, if you are uh, painting, you have this easel. You don't use it all of the time. You can you can st you can um, um, uh, make it available for uh, someone else as well, as long as you don't use it. Everybody else can use it. This needs an infrastructure. This needs some trust, mutual trust, to be done. Uh, but once it's there. It functions very well. This is Kalkbreite. And also, we have this shared function. For instance, initially, you think we should have an atelier together where we can paint things. And then 
the children go up uh, and five years later you don't have the time to paint anymore and the children demand their own space and this is what happens. I think this is really funny. Um, the, um, over time demand of the use of spaces is changing and uh, the organization is able to adapt uh, based <coughs> on that. And also uh, Christian also mentioned this, this, this generous space for, for the, the traffic to get to your apartment. Um, the way uh, um, the public parts of the building are connected to the public space. This is in Vienna. On the both sides of this beautiful building you could see what real estate developers are doing in the same neighborhood. Well, I know where I'd rather be. And this, uh, this kind of projects attract a lot of, um, not only you know, uh, the, or, uh, the uh, spaces that are for the narrow defined community, but also for a broader community, finds, um, uh, they find uh, place in these kind of projects. Gleis 21 in Vienna is this project. The third thing I want to talk about, um, and here I borrow the title of a very good book on this Swiss Genossenschaft, Topologies for a Changing Society. You know, the, so the, the Mal Atelier, the painting Atelier, is a very minimal um, uh, example of that. But everybody knows that the way we live together and our households are combined and are organized is changing um, rapidly and the demands for that are changing as well. And how does this express itself in architecture? And how, does the, how do the architecture that we produce enable this diversity of living together and forming households and also the changes that can occur over time in this respect. And I think it's very interesting to see that there are different responses to that with the cooperatives. This is Genossenschaft, um, the Cooperative Großstadt in uh, Munich, which also have these very uh, um, um, well done models. Well, the same architecture and the models are uh, correspon corresponding with each other. Um, there, they made a very, very rigid um, uh, project, which is at the same time very flexible. You see, on the left side, you see a, a small um, uh, enfilade of uh, which is a which is a small balcony. You can open your windows there. It's like a winter garden. Then there's a strip with smaller uh, elements which you can use as uh, bedrooms. Then the core is there. And then there's another strip which can be used differently. And you see here, these are different uh, ways of arranging these elements together. In the architecture, this is done by the way the separating uh, walls and uh, doors and uh, uh, installations are used here. So it's very pre, um, um, uh, prefabricated how this can be, how, how this can develop and change over time. But it has these uh, huge uh, amount of possibilities. Uh, in which the, the individual cell, you might say, is connected to a larger element and how this larger element also might connect to an even larger element. Which brings this kind of quite, you know, it's, 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 a, it's very uh, German in its uh, expression, this architecture, you might say. But it's also very um, uh, easy to adapt uh, according to the needs of different households. San Remo is it in Munich. Yes, and of course I cannot leave Kalkbreiter out of this presentation. But I would like to show this um, uh, um, page in which you see all the housing types that are in this building. So this has this. And this is interesting, not only because of the diversity which, which you see here, it's also interesting there's a story line which talks about the kitchens of Kalkbreiter because all the elements that you see uh, here have kitchens. So you can have dinner in your own very small apartment. You can have dinner uh, at the group table in a, in a, in a, um, um, a Großwohnung, as they call it. You could have dinner. Um, there is a Großwohnung with people who, are, um, uh, who decided to um, hire a cook who cooks for them two times a week. And the gastronomy is excellent there. You could have dinner there. But also, um, in, the, in the public uh, plinth of the building, there are restaurants and bars. So there are many options to choose from, and not only where you cook, but also every table has a social uh, context, of course, as well. So dining together is an act of living together. 
the same Genossenschaft uh, that um, made, made Kalkbreite made this Zollhaus project. Um, also here you could see how the, the topology for a changing society, changing demands, changing ideas of how to live together are, um, are organized in this building, are expressed in this building. And this is interesting because here the idea was originally the cooperatives also uh, used these um, uh, industrial uh, areas where uh, you know artists could uh, could like colonize space where there's no clear um, division between where you live and where you work and where you meet your friends and where you are producing your work and where you are having fun and this whole idea of this Hallen was taken up also here can we make that in newly developed um, housing projects and this would prove to be very difficult because of the economic conditions to make, make it affordable. So in the end, they really had to shrink it down. Um, but basically, they, what you see <laughs> here is what they, uh, what they managed to organize is that you have these um, uh, parts of the building which don't have a clear um, uh, bestemming um, mm, uh, function yes. yeah, as um, uh, only housing, but also um, are used as uh, uh, spaces for production, um, and in which it's also very open how this is done, and it can be changed over five years again. Tall housing, Zurich. So, and now the 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 fourth part I want to talk about commons are also something about the long term. It's not just about what we do now and how we live now, but it's also looking forward to how will we do it in 10 years. And um, uh, you see that the mutual trust that is built in these cooperatives for housing is also translating to other domains. So it's not just housing, it's also changing to food. This is in uh, Zollhaus where you could see that they're starting a food cooperative only three months after they opened it up. Um, and it's not just food, it also has to do with mobility and uh, the way the, the mobility is organized. Um, so this is a very, you know, it's a central city location next to the Hauptstation of Zurich. Um, uh, so you only have car parking space for like five cars or something like that. If you're going to live there, you don't have a car. You don't need a car. You can have the shared options of mobility for that. Um, and I think it's very interesting that this is not just that people think we want to share mobility and we want to share this and share that. The reason behind it is this, this very strict policy that, um, that is there in Zurich in which they say we have the 2000 Watt Gesellschaft. And it's a kind of budget approach to the amount of energy that everybody uses. And the amount of energy is not only the energy you use for your life, it's also the energy that's used to produce your building and it's also your the energy uh, that's used to, to um, uh, organize your food and your mobility. And this whole uh, approach uh, leads to a process in which it's not just about installations, but it's also about how do we use the building? What decisions do we make when we decide on the quality of the, um, uh, um, the installations that we make? Because you could say that every, uh, every day of the year temperature should be 18 degrees, but maybe you are okay if it's sometimes 16 degrees and sometimes 22 degrees, uh, and that everybody adapts to that in their own way. That's something you can negotiate and that you can decide together as a cooperative. And I think it's very interesting, this 2000 Watt Gesellschaft uh, approach is very interesting because it's also something that cooperatives are learning. So it's, it started in the, in the 19s already, 1990s. And then it was really revolutionary, and but everybody thought, well, how can we do it? How can we calculate it? How can we, um, how can we guarantee that what we say is also what we realize? And you see that gradually cooperatives are learning from each other in the way these ideas are applied. And then it's not just about us and this group here and now, it's also about what can we, uh, how can we be of significance for those around us who don't make uh, part of our uh, uh, common but need to be um, taken care of. So I think this diagram is also very interesting. It shows how the cooperative um, uh, uh, Kalkbreite is evaluating itself when uh, they realize the Zollhaus project, um, what were our goals? 
when we go to s certain uh, social goals, or the, like who do we want to live where, how, how affordable do we want to be, how accessible do we want to be, and what did we realize? So this is also, and this is public information, it's not just only on their annual agenda at uh, the end of the year, this is publicly shared. So there, this whole process of learning, of getting better, or of, of being clear on your goals and also um, communicating about the ways you uh, are able to achieve them is something which <coughs> is, I think, important for the long term because it shows a kind of uh, gradual improvement, a process of learning. Well, and then I come to the fifth point, a house and a city. And here you see Andreas Hofer, who is presenting the model of um, Meer's Wonen, the project in which all projects come together, you might say. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's the project that Genossenschaft in Zurich did together as a kind of um, um, celebration of the 100th year uh, of the cooperative <coughs> movement in, uh, in, uh, in Zurich. And um, what you see here is very interesting because this is a model and this is a project in which the area development is done on a cooperative basis. So it's basically the CLT plus cooperatives which are realizing here together this kind of quartier, a neighborhood. And the neighborhood um, means that the spaces are well defined, that people uh, know how to use them and, and want to use them as an extension of their living room, but it's not doesn't feel private, it feels public, you're welcome there. Um, and this diagram I think is very beautiful because it shows that the layout of uh, the quartier, the neighborhood, is mirrored <coughs> in the layout of one of the, one of the blocks that is uh, built there. And then you see that the, you know, the public space which, which, which has the, um, the public character of the quartier and the collective space which has the, you know, the porosity of the building and the way the building is also mirroring this kind of, um, um, well, you have this, this gradual um, transition from public via collective to your private space is something which is an elaborate element of design, of thinking about how we want to live in the city. Miels Wonen, so here you see it more in detail. I found this diagram, it's not from a project that we have here, but this is a diagram from the project Spreefeld in Berlin. I guess IFAL was also connected to this uh, uh, project. I think it shows very clear this, 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 this uh, um, gradient of private to public and how this is part of the design and the thinking and also the functioning of these kind of projects. Um, not just, not just uh, public and private define how these buildings uh, uh, operate like a city in itself. It's also the mix of functions that you have here. Um, uh, Zollhaus again, <coughs> which has this, uh, 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 all these kind of, you know, uh, orange is just housing, but uh, the, the rest is all these kind of different functions which are more or less private or um, accessible for everyone. And then the, this is the last project I want to share with you. It's not just about, um, um, not just about these projects as neighborhoods. It's also these projects have to land in contexts which are sometimes not easy. You know, this is in Munich, uh, the redevelopment area, uh, in which the context is defined by well, real estate investor or oriented uh, um, developments, um, offices. Uh, how do you make a space that's harboring and welcome there, that families are um, willing to use and uh, can see as a good alternative for living in a village uh, out of the city, um, that can, uh, can be welcoming and uh, at the same time uh, sheltering. And this project, I think, did that in a very elegant way because they have two levels. You have the ground floor and then you see these this, this, uh, bridges connecting the different building blocks um, uh, on the top level of the buildings. It's a public street, no, it's a collective street which connects these blocks and also gives this kind of sheltered space um, which can be used by the residents. Here you see it from the top. And you also see how the context, it's a park house you see on the left. Well, you have to relate to it in some way or another. And I think this porosity that these projects have and the mutuality that they're able to uh, organize with the city are something which are very big um, uh, quality of the way these projects work and are uh, functioning in their 
context. So that's where I end. Thank you.